Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Crosswood Bookstores and Productivity and Publishing Private Limited, I extend a very, very warm welcome to each one of you. As you know, we have gathered here today for the book launch of Un Unlock the Real Power of Ideation by R. Sridhar. And we are very, very delighted to have our author here as well. As you all know, we have Crosswood Bookstores over here. We're extremely excited to have you here, each one of you for taking our time and being present here for this wonderful book launch. Crossword aims to be a point of cultural and social interaction where authors and poets hold court, where children are regaled, where people gravitate to be informed, to be entertained, even enlightened. The name embodies the vision of Crossword as a place and space for people who seek information, knowledge, or just the pleasure of reading. Taking our vision of making reading the ultimate pleasure and crossword, the reading destination which stocks the widest range of books and non-books merchandise, crossword with 86 stores including own and franchisee stores. Can we have a huge round of applause for the crossword bookstores please. And now, uh, I would like to call upon our author, Mr. R. Sridhar, and our distinguished guest. Can we have our author, R. Sridhar, along with our distinguished guest, Mr. S. Ramadurai, who is a former Vice Chairman of Tata Consultancy Services and former Chairman of National Skill Development Agency and National Skill Development Corporation. Can we clap for them so they keep coming? Yes, definitely. Then may I request Mr. B. S. Nagesh, who is the founder of Train. Can we have a huge round of applause for him as well? And we have Mr. Piyush Pandey, who is the Executive Chairman and Creative Director, South Asia, Ogilvy and Meta. Our author, Mr. R. Sridhar is an innovation facilitator, consultant and coach who helps his clients benefit from the power of ideas. Sridhar had a distinguished career in Ogilvy and Meta for 25 long years. He started India's first direct marketing agency. Subsequently, he also set up Ogilvy Consulting. He was the director of Ogilvy and Meta India when he decided to set up his own innovation practice in 2000. Sridhar completed a six-month distance learning program from the Open University Business School, UK, on creativity, innovation and change. He is an accredited CEO coach from the Coaching Foundation of India. So make me hear it up for Mr. R. Sridhar. And may I request now our author R. Sridhar 
to kindly introduce our distinguished guest over here and take the evening forward. Over to you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm absolutely delighted to be here as an author. I never imagined in my life that we uh, actually writing a book and it will get published and we'll have such distinguished guests to be here to release the book. Um, before I move on to anything uh, further, I want to make one very important announcement to all of you who are uh, videotaping or posting it on Facebook. Please go ahead and do that. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing is that I think there is a hashtag they will, use to, they will ask you to use, they are requesting you to use, which is hashtag unlock ideas, right? Now, I believe if you do that, all the uh, various nice messages might come back to me, apparently. That's what I was promised. So please go ahead and use the hashtag for everybody's benefit. Um, I, I sincerely thank uh, Mr. Ramarotharai and uh, Nagesh and Piyush. I think it... Um, it may not be a great idea for me to actually introduce all of them because all of us know all of them so well. So I'm going to skip that portion and I can see the relief on all their faces in terms of the, the introduction not being done. Uh, the thing that I want to do though is that uh, in terms of what are we going to do now is uh, very quite different from the kind of normal book launches that we might have been used to. Uh, Actually, we are not going to talk about the book. Okay, we are going to talk about a very important issue that the key character in the book has raised, raised very, very clearly, and that's something that I have always witnessed when I go to meet a CEO. That's the question he raises. The question he always raises is, why is it that our bright managers are unable to think differently? Right. So. What I thought we would do is that we would request our guests to talk about this issue and we will have the benefit of a completely different set of views, one from Mr. Ramutrai who has been in, uh, in the consulting and the IT part of the business of this country and uh, expanding all around the world and there is Piyush who has uh, been spreading the Indian way of advertising and making it really uh, acceptable, admired and award winning. And of course, Nagesh, who actually pioneered the entire new retail movement in this country. He being so humble, he will never actually say it aloud, right? So from their perspective, if we were to ask them this question, saying, why is it that bright managers are unable to think differently? I must actually add one small uh, part or point of view in this. This question presupposes that the responsibility lies with the manager. That, that's the reason why he is not able to think differently. And uh, I suspect that may not entirely be true. So I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Mr. Ramdurai to start the discussion going, saying, why is it that bright managers are unable to think differently from your perspective, sir? Well, first of all, let me congratulate Sridhar on releasing a great book. Not only did I read the whole book, but also made my mother-in-law read the book. So both of us have read <laughs> She only told me she had read the book. She didn't tell me what she read. Be that may, see all of us have been managers at some time or the other. And we have been extremely scared of our bosses because you hold the boss as if in a hierarchy he is at the topmost and anything you say may be misconstrued unless the boss is open to listening to you. Invariably the bosses are extremely intolerant and they are not listening at all. So how do you communicate with them so that your different point of view can be communicated? And the only way I learned that was instead of arguing with him or talking, I would write to him and then give my different opinion. That way you got to agree or disagree on certain things, which resulted in a confidence on both sides to say that now we can discuss and we can differ. 
So the process of communicating and how do you communicate the differences is most critical. As a manager, you left, you learnt it. But invariably, what you see in most of the organization is the hierarchy is so prevalent that anything which you want to say which is different from something is misconstrued, including by your own colleagues who think that he is a nuisance or she is a nuisance. That's the way I would put it. Your point of view, uh, you always I, I, had a different point of view. <laughs> I, 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 I'll step back one, one from Mr. Ramadur, I can't disagree with him. Um, I disagree with him only on a personal experience that I didn't have bosses of that kind. Ranjan, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you invited your boss. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, first of all, Sridhar, I don't want to generalize that all marketing people are like that. Uh, there are some very brilliant ones also who have a mind of their own and, and they will spark ideas in you. I think the problem lies with the business schools. I think <laughs> you don't send people with an open mind and eyes and ears open. They send you people who think they are CEOs on day one. And therefore, they are not willing to ideate. And then you combine it with what Mr. Ramadura just said. There are bosses who are that kind. And if I was to suggest some solutions, I would say that the business schools must look at some kind of a curriculum to say, I have taught you the game of cricket. Now, I will teach you to be a team player. Okay. And I think uh, in any marketing scenario, it's the team that wins and not individuals. And uh, on our side, as older people, I think we should be a lot more sharing. We should be anecdotal. We should be storytellers to open their minds up. That's what I think. And that, that will probably facilitate people to come up with the ideas that they have, but they are either reluctant to share them with you because they anticipate as to what the boss will think or they are going by so much by the book that they don't want to play in a seva kind of way they would like okay. to be correct like a tindulkar. Right. <laughs> so I think uh, the onus is on all of us. Nagesh, I, I want to add one dimension to this question that I am going to ask you. You have been in a business where um, all the people are customer facing on the line all the time. Right? Uh, they don't have the luxury of sitting in an office and coming and sharing the views and taking calls and decisions. They have to take a call or a decision in front of the customer in that very moment. So how have you been able to help them think differently and perform in that exemplary manner that you have trained them to? Okay, since Piyush said the storytelling, so let me tell you a story. <laughs> uh, the customer who came to a hypermarket in Amritsar and he bought a treadmill worth 26,000 rupees. After he bought the treadmill, he asked the sales associate, a young Sadar, 21 year old, ki isko deliver kar doge kya? And as usual, he said, ho jayega ji. <laughs> and he went to the cash counter and as usual, before you pay the cash, you have to ask sir, where it has to be delivered. This had to be delivered in a small village 600 kilometers away from Amritsar. <laughs> the cost of delivery of this machine was 6,000 rupees. Uh, this young guy didn't want to not stand to his commitment. He went to his supervisor, store manager, and this is the paga ho gaya kya? Now, 26,000 machine spent 6,000 delivery. He says the company's SOP is to spend 600 rupees for local delivery. He said, can you please write to your manager, CEO? So from store manager, regional manager, national manager, CEO it went. And finally everybody said, this is not possible. This guy said, I have commit kar diya hai. Main to isko deliver karunga. He found out that in our country, you can load anything you want on a state transport bus. Nobody asks you a question whether the passenger is inside unlike an airline. So he bought a ticket for that village for 160 rupees, loaded the machine on top, took a picture of the ticket and WhatsApp to the customer and told him, sir, you please unload it, whatever is the unloading charge, I'll pay you. The customer got this machine unloaded for 80 rupees. So this gentleman delivered a machine 600 kilometers away for 160 plus 80 to 40 rupees 
he got an order of 20 machines from that village or small town i don't know why that village requires 20 machines but that's a different <laughs> question <laughs> But end of the day, when I looked at this case, this is this was one of the winner of our train retail awards in 2014 in Delhi. When I looked at it, I saw only two things. I saw that there's a big challenge in the way we parent. To me, the parenting is, I mean, he's talking of MBA that is after 21 years. This guy is 10th pass, okay, earns 9,000 rupees, and he is a sales associate on the front end. Yeah. The second part is that we are always talking of business other than purpose. This guy's purpose was so clear. Mujhe right. sir, aapko deliver karna hai. Right. Every person in the company was either cost conscious or profit oriented or following the strong SOPs. And today also if you look at a lot of places, our children, we have put them into such such productive environment. We don't allow them to experiment. So today morning when I was talking to my wife and children that I'm coming for the session, I remembered Piyush youngsters used to play Gulli Danda. Yeah? Yeah. And that Gulli. You know, we used to go, keep playing, go 5-6 kilometers and the gulli used to get lost. You know, we used to go and take one small branch and make gulli out of it and start playing again. Yeah. This was experimentation. This was trying to do new things. Today, I don't know how many of us are actually to do this. Yeah, and, and your manager probably would have told me, <laughs> 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 so, so I, what I have realized is, and this is what she said, I believe, that if we are able to very clearly define the purpose at the front end, and it's only one. Your customer's experience has to be positive. He has to go with positive right. experience. It works. I can I can tell you lots of stories as to how empowered people have done fantastic things in the organization. People who are not educated, not MBA, are not paid a million dollar salary, and a lot of us sitting at the back offices sometimes are not able to do because we have restricted ourselves with rules. Some boundaries are created by somebody else, but most boundaries are created by ourselves. That's interesting. Most boundaries are created by ourselves. <laughs> It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing way to state the problem. Um, the issue I see is that uh, the, the more boundaries seem to be existing in the top echelons of the organization than they were existing probably. Okay, at least in many cases people have said so. So how does one manage this uh, transition of the, I mean on one hand the people are asking saying why are young managers or bright managers not thinking differently and the, the Boundaries are actually set on the top. So how does one manage this equation? If we really want to be an innovation, innovative country, making a difference not only to our nation, but to the entire world, uh, is there a way in which we can influence leadership is, uh, is a big question that comes up in, uh, in the minds of people. So uh, do you want to start the ball rolling on this issue? Well, I, I just want to give you one more example. I, I don't agree with you saying that uh, you know, the young people are actually limited by boundaries. Young people are not limited by boundaries. Okay. For the young people, the so-called old people create boundaries. Let me give you an example. Right. In most companies in the country today, the consumers are in their 20s. You would agree? Right. right. The managers are in their 30s. The CEOs are in their 50s. Correct. And the board is in 60s. <laughs> so <laughs> please tell me, how can this actually connect to the front end? That's the biggest issue. In one of the companies where it's a very well-known company, the board decided to create a young board. It is a parallel board of 28 year old and they are allowed to take similar decisions for challenges that come to the board. Right. And you'll be surprised that innovation which was a cycle of 18 months okay, is happening now in one case in six months time. Wow. So what, what did you do very differently? Nothing. You just said guys if you take a decision we'll support you. There's no question of decision. These guys went, innovated, decided and actually went into execution. They created a prototype. But any other place you would have said, get me, get me a consultant, do a research, you know, find out this, all those things. So I think it, it's, if you allow, if you create an environment for ideation, innovation, it works beautifully. And that's why I said parenting is important because I think the, at the parenting stage, probably we're not creating an environment. We're creating a productive environment. And uh, you know, today, for example, a child, I mean, if it falls, there's a pram to protect because the child is not coming out. There's a maid to carry the pram. Right. Okay, and you go to the street. There's a street worker with two children. Look at the way child. The child is crossing the road with all cars coming. There's right. no issue. Right. Will you make your child or grandchild cross the road? No. So I think this is the way we are actually doing this, and that's my person. I don't know how you say. I it. Don't yeah. really agree, agree with you. So the emphasis seems to be uh, one on not making a mistake ever, and wanting to be right all the time. Is that the is that the issue? I, I, I would say so. I would say so. 
because I think the cost of mistake for most of us comes from a past experience. Right. Right. Which and which, which is which is a baggage. Which is a baggage. Yes. Okay. I can give you one more very in interesting example. In 1991, when we started Shop to Stop, I was the first employee. For the first three years, we did not take a single person from retail, single person from garment. Not one of us had any clue about the business. So whatever we said, we said, Ho I mean, unbelievable things we did. One customer told me, what a tie collection, you have 500 ties. So I asked him, sir, how many ties you should have? He said, 5,000 to hona chahiye. So I went back to my team and said, can we have 5, 6,000 ties collection? They said, sir, you give you a place and we'll have a 10,000 tie. We had 10,000 ties, we sold 10,000 ties in one month. Never heard of anywhere in the world. <laughs> of a team which has never done ties. <laughs> but if you go to a buyer who is actually in the tie business, he'll say 10,000 ties, Macy doesn't have, this doesn't have, right. that doesn't have. Right. So I, it, it, it's like that. It's like that. So the, the issue is also one of saying that somebody comes out with an idea. Okay, In your case, I think the, the line was very short where they could say this and you could immediately take that. But in most organizations, a, an employee has an idea and then he has to internally sell it. I know Piyush gently doesn't agree with the idea of selling an idea. He says you've got to help the other guy understand your logic or point of view. That is what the process should be. But this entire business of submitting an idea in an idea system and then, then some guy is looking at it and then it's going and coming back. Now this entire thing goes in the circle, right? So how does one break this syndrome and get people on a fast track in this process? Uh, you want me to answer that? I, yes. I, I, I have always felt and learned over the years that ideas cannot be sent. Ideas cannot be written. Ideas cannot be put onto a PPT. Right. Ideas have to be shared across the table, discussed, enjoyed, persuaded yeah. and taken forward. I think uh, half the times ideation process is hindered by not having an interface right and people write ideas people read ideas in a boring situation they are not out and i think uh, i also agree with Nagesh that the problem is that the talk is restricting i i will share another story with you uh, today's story yeah. fresh from the oven this afternoon <laughs> if we don't share stories with people people's minds will not open this. Uh, I met a doctor friend of mine three, four days back who lives in Panchgani and he happened to meet Anand Bakshi's son and he narrated a beautiful story, the, the son. And he said, uh, many years back, my father was working with Mahesh Bhatt mm. and Mahesh Bhatt came and requested him for a song and he described the situation as a husband who doesn't come home very often, is traveling or whatever the scene is. Mm -hmm. He only comes home once in a blue moon. And Anand Bakshi wrote, Gali mein aaj chand nikla. Ah. <laughs> and I wrote a note to all my colleagues in Ogilvy today saying that briefs come from the head, leaps come from the heart. Wonderful. And if you don't share these stories, they will not get the license to liberate themselves. Right. So I, I agree with Nagesh completely that we have to help unlock. Right. They will not unlock on their own if, if the senior members and the business schools, sorry Ambi. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we, we have to unlock. We have to help them unlock. I, I, you, you are absolutely right that um, they were not trained to ideate. Can we hold their hand into right. a place where they can hold your hand and take you to? Absolutely. So one challenge I, I see in your business which is very different from this is that one, your people are spread all over the world and uh, the, uh, the possibility of the, uh, the, uh, the, number, the frequency of personal one-to-one -one interactions probably is limited and you may have to use technology to communicate. So how do you use that to overcome some of these uh, issues? Well, you see as the size of the organization grows, when you cross geographies and distances, 
I think empowerment becomes a very, very critical component of anything which you do. Even for the first question, how do you unlock the boundaries is by empowerment. Right. When you empower somebody, you've got to have a hundred percent trust that they are going to experiment, they are going to do things differently, but ultimately they are aligned to the overall objectives of the company. Right. Right. And we got somebody, what we call as a chief transformation officer, hmm. when we digitized the whole organization in 2000 year. And it took us three years to get it across the entire organization, even though the number of geographies, uh, geographies we operated were not to the extent what it is today. Right. I think the alignment and total empowerment and trust is what leads to communication at all levels because one person cannot communicate to everybody in every geography. Right. Right. The consistency of purpose, constant communication becomes very necessary and that's why we use technology in addition to physical communication. Right. You do open houses, you do one-on-ones, you do the digital communication and a digital nerve system which you have built must be completely, the infrastructure must be built before you do that. Today communicating with 385,000 people across the world is not difficult at all. Right. We experimented way back in uh, 2000, once the digital system was there, where we did what we call as an IDS session. Right. And online we logged about 12,000 of our employees across. And five of our people, including me, were the whole day for a week, we were taking all the ideas in terms of what do they think we need to do differently. And we got about 400 ideas, which we said we will also implement these 400 ideas and then share that we are really serious about it. Because ideas can be given, but if you don't care about it, then the child isn't you have to do nothing. So we published the metrics to say that how many of them were really implemented on the ground. That's the way we did. There is the, what's also coming through in this, that there is an element of, uh, within quotes, culture that is coming in, right? So there is a way in which what people behave and how they believe and how they behave in the context of idea. Um, so what, how would you define the culture or a creative climate? How would you define that? Actually, uh, to me, what is said acts also leading to one word of ownership. Right? Yeah. Right. And uh, let me give you one more example. Uh, in a company where we are losing 100 crores, mm. okay, and as usual in this com many places we talk so big about the company that uh, employees don't even know as to the company is losing money. If you are a private company, right. front end employees will not know that you are losing money because nobody wants to say it. Yeah. So when I address the company employees, I said, you know, we are losing money. I wish if each one of you can help us achieve 1 rupee profit. Right. Can you believe who got the first 1 rupee within 24 hours? In a go down, a packer next day morning called up to say if we stop sealing our grain packets by one centimeter every day, he says I'll save one kg by the end of the day. Wow. <laughs> the difference was that he suddenly felt that since we are saying boss, we are all losing money, can we help? We included him to be part of the ownership. Right. I can make it happen. Yeah, I that can make it thing. happen and right. not, nobody had ever spoken right. to him. So I think what Ramtharai said was that the moment he opened it to 12,000 people right. and then it was not ideation for TCS, it was ideation for 12,000 plus the four people, then it's about I am part of this game. Yeah. So if the moment you bring in inclusion right. and then you empower people, then it's a powerful, potent thing to Absolutely. take on. It's had a multiplier effect and what is amazing is that scale is not an issue. When most issue. people think that you know it has to be a one program, it has to be a small team and so on and so forth. I mean you have just broken that barrier completely. So what kind of leaders do you think will emerge in the future for making this entire yeah, I, I cannot have a meeting of us without using a cricket analogy. We have just done with IPL three days back. Right. You know the rules of IPL are that no more than four international players can play in a game. The original rule also says that four of them should be less than 20 years old. Hmm. End of the day, 11 people play the game. If you do not allow those four people to perform, how will you win a match? It's as simple as that. And I think if we look at it, the composition of a company is the same scenario. I think we have to unlock them, we have to respect them, we have to allow them to play. We can't tell them all, they play like me. Everyone can't play the same yeah, way. Yeah. And maybe they are better than you. I, I, I think so. On the other part, I just want to agree with Nagesh. 
He said, 20 year old, 50 year old, when you come to the board, you are 60 year old. Right. But I, even at 72, even though I'm in a board, I also work on the board. <laughs> Different league altogether. <laughs> Seventy, a man is a child all over again. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm 68. <laughs> See, the other thing that you mentioned about is, I think it's largely in the context of education, and the other thing is about parenting. Now, so let's take this I am business, right? If you had the freedom, let's assume if you had the freedom. No, no, I, I didn't show you. Yeah, I was just. See, see, I am. We are not talking about Ambi. Ambi, I am has to change their name. Everyone comes out from there thinking I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we, if you had the option to redo their curriculum, right? Uh, what is one of the most important things that you see, do? See, you do? don't have to change their curriculum. Huh. They are teaching you the game, which is fine. Add something to their curriculum to say, huh. I have taught you how to breathe, but be open to breathing fresh air. Okay. As simple as that. I, I would add a course to say, open your minds. When you go out in the world, there is so much to learn. Keep your eyes and ears open. Ideas will come from people senior, people who are youngsters. Ideas can come from anywhere. I would definitely add a course out there to get them to think, I know how to play the game, but there is a world which has got so many learnings, right. be open to those. Okay. Yes sir. Yeah, you are saying something. No, I think uh, she correctly said that it has started the school. Right. But I think um, it's very, very structured the MBA programs or the uh, so that the result the interdisciplinary nature of problem solving and how do you bring different disciplines together has to be brought. Right. And I went I didn't go to Clary I am. I went to the Sloan School and then the MBA there was completely interdisciplinary. Okay. The amount of material they threw at you with regard to reading even before you went there and then during the course and if you said that we don't like this at all, we need a different curriculum in terms of getting some people who are different, they make sure in the next session they brought somebody different. Wow. So that's the kind of flexibility they built into the whole curriculum so that it was more to the needs of the customer, namely 43 or 44 of us, rather than to say that here is the thing which is packaged and you got to live it. And the last one week of the program was with the family where the problem solving, where that dimension are also brought into the whole things. That's the kind of flexibility you need to build, which can take you to different places because we are dealing with very, very bright people at the end of the day. What is the role of mistakes in all of this? You know, I think people are more intolerant of mistakes today than we had the benefit when we had bosses and we, we were young and we had uh, Pranjan is sitting here, right? Uh, I think uh, more leeway we got in the context of mistakes. Yeah. yeah. She then see it's very simple. Um, what money I used to say, <laughs> take your job seriously, don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> and uh, again, back to cricket. Your best player drops a catch. Yeah. Are you going to kill him? He just scored a hundred, but he dropped a crucial catch. Learn to live with it. Mistakes will be made. Without mistakes, you are going by the book and book will never make you excel. You have to go beyond the book. Mistakes, we are all human. I mean, you're, if Dhoni drops a catch and you lose a game, is Dhoni bad? No, he's got many other things to tell you that catches can be dropped. So I think you have to learn to live with mistakes. Also, I think Sridhar, we many times we confuse between mistake and failure. So what's the difference? See, if you go and look at innovations, most innovations are emerged out of mistakes. Right. But if you look at failure, the moment you define a mistake into a failure, you have stopped the whole process of innovation. You killed it completely. You have killed it. Yeah. Okay, if we do 100 mistakes, you still not, not be a failure. Today, if you look at startup people, I mean, somebody starts it up and fails and then again comes up. 
Yes. Okay. Makes a mistake and fails, but we actually say he's a failure. That's the end of it. So every time, and in an organization which is not an organization but an organism, where millions of people are doing millions of acts over millions of transactions, there are mistakes happening. The problem is this whole process of wanting to identify mistake, right. because organizations are built on identifying mistakes and correcting them. If you go and look at any organization standard operating procedure, all SOPs are made for the one person people who make mistakes. The moment you find a mistake, next day, next day say this should not be done. So I am saying capitalize on the strengths. Don't look at the mistake. Never, never nomenclate a mistake as a failure. And that's where I think the problem starts. So allow people to make mistakes. Yeah, but if you see the quality movement, for instance, the quality movement works on the principle of minimizing errors, and errors or mistakes. So I think every time you come out with this, your track record, your uh, the, the reports that you show is not about how many things went right, but then we used to have an error level of X percent, which has been reduced to Y percent. So if the focus seems to be on errors, right? So how does one manage this? No, you're, when you correct mistakes, you're correcting mistakes of the past. Right. When you're wanting to build something which is failure free, you're doing it for the future. So mistake correction, SOPs, quality manuals are all created from the past. And today, past one second doesn't exist. Something new is happening. So I think that that's where the, the way we look at things and the freedom has to be very, very I think uh, Nagesh is absolutely right. When you look at a uh, NASA program and you have got to take a man to the moon and bring him back safely, right. the software has to work perfectly. Right. And there are certain techniques of building software where the size of the code and certain do's and don'ts and every programmer has to have somebody who is detecting and how many mistakes he produces out of the code is what he is rewarded for not for leaving the mistakes and we have got mathematical models to say that if the size of the program is 1000 lines mm. and it's in Fortran or in PR1 or C or whatever it is, right. this many mistakes you have to detect unless you detect it the program is not 100% fail safe. That's the level of rigor that's why for us risk taking and failure in a Silicon Valley kind of a thing is a way of life and it's accepted because that's the way you do it. The best way is if you look at your own home. Okay, and if you look at the food that you buy for mother or sister, whoever serves you, the kind of ingredient changes there happens. There's no consistency, but the beauty is there is a taste. Okay, and if you go back and look at it, salt, jada dala, kam dala is a mistake. Yeah. What do you do with it? I say you nice say, things if it is my wife. Say, darling, don't cook from tomorrow, I'm going to come and cook. <laughs> Did you say that? It never happens. You say, oh, it was very nice, can you cook better tomorrow? I think that's what you require in organization. But you're, you're raising a very interesting thing because at the end of the day, you're saying that there is a certain kind of tolerance that comes into the equation depending on who makes the mistakes within quotes, right? Which means that even within the organization, the relationship between the decision maker and the people who report to them, if that is actually willing to be so understanding, I think we will be in a position to create a climate that is far more it's tolerant, it's right? It's very simple. Um, the person who may have made a mistake, do you want to live with him as a better person or do you want to get rid of him? If you want to get rid of him, you will keep pointing from the mistakes. If you think that person has got a lot within him, you will help him to say, maybe this is the way you could do it better. So I, I, I think it's so interpersonal in terms of unlocking minds. Yeah. Otherwise, um, you are actually saying to the person you are useless. As you said, the difference between mistake and a failure. I have not declared you as a failure. Yeah. I know that this mistake I could also have made. And maybe this is the way uh, you can get it over with. So that's bringing us into the, uh, the, the area of judgment. You know, when you look at things, you judge things. And uh, I know a lot of senior people to pride themselves in the fact that I can look at this and I can tell you whether this will work or not. And they judge. In a matter of few seconds they judge and say that's how this is in place. So how does this work in terms of senior management wanting to prove that they can judge what is right, what is wrong and I have a track record kind of stuff. So that will actually create a whole lot of new We are working together, right? Managers have to change the way they take decisions. I think judgment comes from your past experience exactly. and uh, so most of the times you are bringing that from that point of view right. that I have done it well. Right. Uh, one of the ways to probably look at this is that you can always express to the person right. 
when I did it like this, it didn't work. Mm. Maybe if you do it like this, there's a possibility it can work. Okay, rather than saying I tried it didn't work, so it will not work because you. That right. guy says, who the hell are you? I am very different than you. Right. Let me try it the way. And many a times you look at it, same processes in factories. Okay, are still able to deliver better results in one factory versus other factory. So, right. I think that that to me is the important thing. So, how do you not carry the baggage and yeah. not therefore judge from there? Right. But but these are not really team dynamics. I think these are all very very individual individual. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the point about mistakes. Instead of pointing to somebody that he or she is making a mistake. In order to look at yourself and how many mistakes you have made and then visualize it rather than complain about somebody right. else. Right. And it itself puts the, uh, the distance is removed. Second thing is judgments are very, very momentary. You just right. conclude saying that he is useless or he is good or it's a wrong thing or whatever it is again. You want to reflect and then uh, before you say anything, you better think through carefully. That's where the listening skills that I found is the most helpful. The more you listen, the more you are able to reflect and then come back with certain right. things in terms of tolerance, in terms of acceptance, in terms of looking at yourself before you comment on others. So, if you were to uh, ask your advice to a young manager, what is the one thing he should do differently? One thing he should do differently to be able to think differently and also get uh, his ideas through within the system. So in the current scenario, what would be your one single advice to this young person? My, my advice is very simple that this is not the last job in the world that you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is not medieval era that uh, <laughs> when you stick your neck out, people will put you on the stakes, burn you on the stakes. <laughs> Do the job, but be yourself. Be fearless. Find a way. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Today I would say, do something with your hands, work as a team, and don't do an MBA. <laughs> I would actually say, uh, be grounded and be connected to your consumer. Okay. How are we doing on time? All right. Do you want to open up uh, for questions from the audience? Yeah, questions from the audience. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm Subhashini. Actually, I find that small children have a lot of ideas in schools, but we brand them as dull and some person who gets a zero in maths is considered very bad. And I feel we need a lot of importance for qualifications. And uh, for example, my servant's daughter is excellent in drawing and sketching, but she she is worried that she won't complete her tenth and she'll not get a job. Every time the parents force them to study maths when they are not interested, maybe in eighth standard itself they can get into creative arts, like if they are interested. So I think we should encourage all fields. That's my thing. I completely agree with you. I have gone through exactly what you. Maid's daughter is going through. My father wanted to do me math, and I didn't know a thing about maths. So yes, there is talent everywhere. People have different talents, and as much as you can encourage any one of us, I think that has to be done. Right. As maths is not the be all and end, end all of life. There are people. There is a singer sitting in front of me, yeah. who is as accomplished as the husband who is sitting here. So. <laughs> Horses for courses. <laughs> now, now, guys, let's all hold mics. <laughs> <laughs> now that you announced that MBAs are not useful animals, uh, will all people working in your respective organizations with an MBA start looking for a job? <laughs> no, I, I really beat them up and make them into human beings very fast. <laughs> I tell them that I didn't get into an MBA. You know, the problem is usually the problem. How people define the problem often limits ideation. And would you agree that very often they set up problems which just needed a redefinition and therefore could, could change? This 
top down this is the problem that has to be solved may be the reason why even the mbas who could be creative can't solve it no well, i think many of them are i i think uh, it goes back to the same old thing of saying have an open mind if if i say that this might be the problem what do you think you have a fresh mind i i, I think um, as he rightly said right now that it's um individual to individual i think if there's a culture that evolves of saying maybe what i'm looking at as the problem is not the real problem maybe you can identify i think this is the problem what do you think i think the uh, uh, your question also leads me to this point of view that most of the time people define problems on based on assumptions from where they have come from and they have not seen the different world and therefore the reframing of the problem is not possible so uh, i think they would need help in terms of a conversation to explore what other things could be an issue right well, i think uh, all i want to say was sridhar has captured this problem definition part of it in the book very very well so i think all of you must buy and read the book <laughs> uh i'm going to take it up a notch i'm asked this question i don't have an answer so i'm asking you what can countries and national governments do to promote the creative sector of the economy as a whole uh not just creativity but since all of you represent the creative industries the question i was asked by governments is what should they be doing to promote creative industry so that the whole country can grow because it obviously it generates a lot of employment and generates a lot of revenue for the country as well um any thoughts on that what do you think india should do or any other country for that matter i think all of us would agree that we have to completely revamp the education system starting from the primary schools also if you are asking about india there is um i i have been reading about it that there is a emphasis with the current government on design that could be one starting point if you look at uk they they are talking about creative being the next stage of growth so what all can be done i think if design is being emphasized maybe other things could be emphasized and uh, taken forward but um, as a problem i couldn't disagree with you it is it is a huge opportunity and actually not a problem yep. that's right <laughs> i want to ask about we teenagers get many options available as a career so it becomes very confusing for us to see to select what we should pursue we have ideas we have ideation we might be creative but then what field should we pursue how do we get into it how to go about it i think you you have a big problem <laughs> um you have a big problem of plenty and i think the answer to that is ask your heart what is it that you're passionate about you might be good at 10 things but there might be one thing that you really love doing if you love doing something you are bound to do well so don't evaluate all the time will i do well or do i love it if you love it you are bound to do well i want to refit the lesson in my right that to really i would try 10 things instead of one thing maybe on the id yeah great when i said this is the very spend the rest of my life doing this i think it's a very interesting way of asking this question and it actually knock out a whole lot of fluff around it if you are able to if you are passionate you would want to spend full life doing that so i think that's start from the heart i think that would be a great thing so keep talking about the heart i just wanted to make one small announcement which i forgot to make right in the beginning Uh, today is the birth of a book and the birth of an author so therefore this is actually a birthday party i just want to ensure that all of you know and you please ensure that you take the uh, what is that called the take home gift the return gift so there is a return gift for each of you please ensure that take the return gift and if you haven't got it tell me i'll make sure that you get the return gift don't go home without the return gift okay now will everyone join me
Happy birthday, Arthur! Happy birthday, Arthur! Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Being a, being a bookstore, I can't ask for a birthday bomb after you. This guy 68 as his age. <laughs> so that is even a birthday cake. Can you imagine what a beautiful queue? There is a birthday cake and we're going to cut a cake and all of us will have a cake as well. Right. Thank you, Shridhar. Thank you for having us here. Thank you all for listening to our nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> May the book win. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And all the best. That was a really wonderful discussion and really insightful as well. And thank you so much for your wonderful questions. And ladies and gentlemen, now the moment has come that we all have been waiting for. We'll be finally launching the book. So we would request our author and all our distinguished, wonderful guests to unwrap the book for us. So can I hear it up for them, guys? Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. For them. For unlock. People from Ogilvy who are here, my boss Ranjan Kapoor is here. All this wouldn't have been possible if it not been for all of them. Even more importantly, my publisher, Mr. K. Srinivasamurthy, is here. I must tell you a small story. When I had the manuscript, all the big publishers said no. And it is Chinu who said, Of course, I will do it. So we give a big hand because of his courage. Thank you very much. Um, may you first to down because so ladies and gentlemen, now we would like, we would request Mr. Malik Desai, who is the head of business of Crossword Bookstores, to come here to say a few words and to give a word of thanks. Him. Crossword, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our esteemed guest. Uh, congratulations once again to Mr. Shida for the launch of the book. Our sincere gratitude uh, to our honourable guest, Mr. Madamzarai, Mr. Kumishma, Mr. B.S. Nagesh, uh, for stimulating the discussion and giving me valuable inputs. Um, and of course, a uh, round of applause for our lovely uh, audience uh, for, for the time and making this a great event. I'd like to take this opportunity, uh, there's a token. That is some other Thank you so much. On behalf of Crossword Bookstores, I would like to thank our distinguished guests for making our time over here for us and our wonderful audience. Thank you so much for being here. It was immense pleasure to have each one of you.